Good afternoon. I'm Governor Jay Inslee, uh, Chairman of the, uh, the DJ uh, uh, Education Workforce Committee, and I'm very excited about our next discussion we're going to have about the intersection of the arts and commerce in our, uh, in our great country. And during this discussion, we governors, of course, think of governing as a performance art, but we'll be thinking of all the other uh, art forms in, in this discussion rather than that one. Uh, our, our discussion today will be centered on the intersection of arts and commerce. And we know that there is such a profound and robust part of our economic growth of the nation and our states around the arts. But I just wanted to kick off, if I could, our discussion of the arts on kind of a personal note, what it means to me. And I know governors all have some personal story themselves. Uh, mine is a, a, a moment I remember checking into a hotel in Bellingham, Washington a few years ago. It was late at night, I was tired. I started talking to the, the fellow behind the desk and he said, uh, yeah, hey, uh, you're Governor Inslee, right? And I said, yes. And he goes, uh, are you related to Frank Inslee? And I go, yeah, that's my little brother. And I said, why? And he said, well, you know, uh, Frank Inslee was an art teacher at Squalicum High School at Bellingham, Washington. I said, yes. And he goes, I got to tell you a story about your brother. Uh, he says, I was a, a junior at Squalicum High School a few years ago, and I was getting ready to drop out. Things were not going well in my life. And I just was not seeing a path to be connected to school. It didn't seem to be relevant to my life and what I like to do. And he said, uh, Governor, your brother, uh, Frank, took me aside and says, look, I see a little talent in you on this particular kind of sketching or something. I think you got a little talent. I want you to come in because I want you to make sure you stay in school. And this young man said, I stayed in school and I graduated. And now I'm, you know, manager of this hotel. And he, he credited my brother for that, who is an, an art teacher. And that story has stuck with me because... I believe arts really can be transformative in people's lives. And any time we can keep a kid in school associated because of the arts, that's a really good thing. So I'm an arts fan, not just because of its economic productivity and the jobs it creates, but what it does in people's lives in general. But let me turn to the immediate topic, which is how we see arts as part of our economic growth programs as governors and how big it is. And the first thing I want to say is it is such a large part of our economic development and it is so understated. I think if you think of our economies, you'd have to say that arts is the most underestimated part of our economies. We think uh, when we're going to build a stadium, we think about the economic growth of professional sports. When we try to recruit a manufacturing company, we think about the jobs it's going to create. But we're sitting on $760 billion uh, of economic productivity in the United States. Five million jobs associated with the arts. And that doesn't pop into our heads in the first instance, but it really should. In my state, it's $35 billion of economic uh, activity and growing very rapidly. It's one of the most rapidly growing parts of my economy next to clean energy. It's growing at 8% a year. So I would suggest the first thing to note about arts is it's a big deal when it comes to economic growth. Second thing I'd like to tee up for discussion is that it is an increasingly important in the transformative part of our economies. Uh, I have a high tech economy in the state of Washington, uh, life science, software, video gaming, uh, aerospace, online retailing. This all demands high tech skills. But what I'm hearing more and more is that the real uh, uh, delivery of high technology requires creative skills and communication skills and there is no better way to do that than to build an ecosystem of people who have that kind of skills and the arts themselves provide that. So if you go to my tech companies today, you will find a lot of people that maybe are, not, are working in the, um, in the life sciences industry today but they were working in the, the video gaming industry uh, last year, working on graphical interface of how to present uh, data. We have a company called Tableau in our country. It's a huge software company growing like crazy. They have figured out a visual way to present data. Well, of course, arts is, is intrinsically important to that development of that particular type of service. So this is a huge part of our economy. It is a growing part of economy because of technology. 
And I'm excited about the things to hear about my fellow governors are doing. We're doing some uh, exciting things in my state. We started a, a program called Certified Creative Districts this year in my state, where we certify districts as artistic districts. And it's helped uh, local communities serve as an anchor, both for tourism and for economic development to build capital in these particular uh, uh, arts-related businesses. And we had 25 communities get excited about this. It's a small thing, but it has focused our, our minds on economic uh, development around the arts. So I'm excited to hear from my fellow governors, starting with Governor uh, Dugard of South Dakota. Thank you, Governor Inslee. Uh, I too want to echo Governor Inslee's comments at the outset that arts will sometimes play an outsized role than we sometimes think in our economies. I was just sitting here thinking that one of the main reasons why many of the people in this room or maybe watching over the screens uh, visit my state is because they're uh, coming to see a piece of art. They're pe coming to see Mount Rushmore, our largest sculpture. And, uh, and I also am reminded that if we have visitors coming to our home states, the first thing we want to do is showcase our arts. We want to take them to a concert or we want to take them to see something, uh, a museum or uh, showcase our arts, bring, bring people who are dancers, native dancers or who are singers. We want to introduce them to our arts. And so it's so important to the quality of life in our homes, in our home state, and also important to the economy of our state. Uh, one thing, uh, Governor Inslee did not mention is that he himself is an artist and uh, in fact he's an accomplished painter and he has brought a painting which the staff are going to be unveiling right now. Oh my goodness. So sweet. <laughs> and, uh, and does that painting have a title, Governor? Uh, I would call it uh, Bear With Me. <laughs> well, very good. Uh, really great. I'm pleased to announce that NGA will be auctioning off this portrait or this uh, the painting this fall with proceeds going to a national arts education nonprofit. So please join me in thanking Governor Inslee for this beautiful contribution. Well, I have your, the your credibility is, is being diminished by your assessment here, <laughs> Governor, but thank you very much. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing uh, some of our panelists. We have the pleasure of being joined by Sarah Trahern, who is the CEO of the esteemed Country Music Association, which was formed in 1958 as the first trade group to promote a single genre of music. She also serves as president of the Country Music Association Foundation Board, which supports music education for, de for deserving children across the United States. Also joining us today is Dr. Edward Ayers, Tucker Boatwright, professional professor of the humanities and president emeritus at the University of Richmond. Dr. Ayers has been named National Professor of the Year and received the National Humanities Medal from President Obama at the White House. Thank you both for being with us here today. And now I'd like to introduce New Mexico's Secretary of Cultural Affairs, Veronica Gonzalez. She's filling in for Governor Martinez, who is under the weather. So uh, we're, we're springing this on you at the last moment. and appreciate you jumping in. Veronica is going to tell us about the vibrant artistic community here in New Mexico and its impact on the local economy. Please welcome Veronica. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, and it's a pleasure to be here. Again, my name is Veronica Gonzalez, and, and I get to talk about one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> it's really been my passion um, for, for really my whole life. And um, serving Governor Martinez in the role as Cultural Affairs Secretary has been a tremendous honor. So it's a pleasure to join you all today um, to share with you a little bit more about our state. I hope you're all having a wonderful time. and taking advantage of beautiful Santa Fe and all that it has to offer. Um, really, few places on earth offer the rich history and cultural diversity found in New Mexico. Um, Native American culture has been present 
here for more than 2,500 years and is home to 22 Native American tribes. Their rich history is celebrated today as well as many other um, cultures in New Mexico in our museums um, and um, dances, our music, our arts and crafts, um, the, the very many languages that are spoken here and our traditional villages. Chaco um, National Historic Park dates to 850 AD and is considered the most exceptional concentration of pueblos in the American Southwest. It is one of only 20 World Heritage Sites and is probably the best representation of the first ever created in New Mexico. Spanish colonial culture arrived in the state in the late 1500s, contributing over 500 years of Hispanic influence to New Mexico's way of life. The annual traditional Spanish market displays this influence through food and art in Santa Fe, which I hope you have had an opportunity to, to experience. Um, it's something that we're very, very proud of here. And um, we are home to the National Institute of Flamenco um, and, and many other um, things like the Spanish market, um, which displays this influence. Um, in our state, and um, really this, this strong culture is found in every aspect of the state, from the food and fiestas to architecture and art. Um, New Mexico is known as the state of the arts um, because it is home to more working artists, open studios, artist-owned galleries, and, spe and specialty and artisan-oriented shops than any other state per capita. Visitors can schedule a studio tour, which is a great way to explore New Mexico by finding new traditional art, meeting the artists, and again, eating our local food. Santa Fe International Folk Art, which is just closed up today, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, last weekend, um, is the largest um, international folk art market of its kind um, in the world. And it brings cultures here from more than 40 countries for over 20,000 visitors each year to experience the height of New Mexico's beauty in the summer. This year's market generated $3.2 million in sales. And visitors are also drawn to the state's many historical sites, museums, and celebrations every year. Um, the New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs is one of the most robust and comprehensive state cultural agencies in the nation. We're very, very proud of the long-standing investment that the people of New Mexico have in our arts and culture um, industry and in, in the assets that the state um, is so proud of. Um, we have eight museums, eight historic sites covering a range of interests from the earliest Native American sites to the history of Billy the Kid, Georgia O'Keeffe, groundbreaking um, paleontological discoveries. There are over 40 museums and hundreds of art galleries throughout the state covering everything from local artisan art to globally known fine arts. As you can see, summer is the season for art in New Mexico, including performance art. 90,000 people attend the Santa Fe Opera season in the world-renowned venue that is really like no other. The economic impact of our opera generates more than 200 million annually for our region and during its season employs 700 people. Nearly any town you visit has its own story of life in the wild old west and in getting there is an exception, I mean an experience in and of itself. This is especially true of the many ghost towns you may encounter along one of New Mexico's 25 magnificent scenic byways which equal over 2,900 miles across a diverse landscape. You can follow one of these paths to take a tour of Georgia O'Keeffe's Ghost Ranch um, in Abiquiu, New Mexico, and then visit the museum dedicated to her life and work here in Santa Fe. You can also follow the film trails, um, which we're very, very proud of our film industry. It has been growing tremendously and um, has brought a lot of economic development to our state. Um, you know, our tourism has had groundbreaking numbers over the last seven years. We've been breaking res records in terms of the visitors um, to New Mexico, and we've seen job growth in tourism of 19% over the last seven years. As Cabinet Secretary of Cultural Affairs, I can 
I can truly attest to the fact that New Mexico is rich in arts and cultural assets and stands above other, other states. These assets constitute a deep resource and incredible point of strength statewide. And as a percentage of population, you know, we're very, very proud of um, the amount of artists, artisans, creators, performers, and writers that we have here. With the leadership of Governor Susana Martinez, um, the Department of Cultural Affairs commissioned an unprecedented study. It was the most comprehensive statewide study um, that has ever been done in New Mexico, looking at how arts and culture contribute to our state's economy. And we found very conservatively, looking at this industry, that we are seeing about a $5.6 billion impact um, to our state. and and support for 80,000 jobs statewide, which equals about one out of 10 um, jobs in our state. It, is, it equals more economic impact than the construction and manufacturing industries combined. Um, and according to um, J Dr. Jeffrey Mitchell, who conducted the study out of the University of New Mexico, arts and culture can no longer simply be seen as a reward for prosperity. Rather, arts and culture have become a prerequisite for economic growth and success. Um, in New Mexico, we have found that partnerships and collaborations are the key to success of the creative economy. Um, recently, um, we have developed many initiatives um, as, a, as a response to the study that help um, New Mexico diversify its economy and take advantage of its tremendous cultural assets, connecting them to the creative economy, which is really the economy that is the fastest growing economy in the world. Um, our tremendous assets include our places and spaces, our landscapes, our open skies, mountains, deserts, rich architecture, archeological and agricultural treasures, historic byways from the Camino Real Santa Fe Trail to Route 66, our towns, our tribes, our pueblos, our central plazas, and our vast open spaces. And I think as Governor Inslee um, um, commented on, you know, connecting these cultural assets really to the applied technology fields is really where the access of true economic prosperity can happen and we're working toward that here in New Mexico. So it's a pleasure to join you. I'm happy to answer any questions um, at the end of, of the presentations. And again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Gonzalez, and thank you for pitch hitting uh, for the governor. Um, Ms. Trahir, and I'm really looking forward to your comments. I want to let you know you're talking uh, to Republicans and Democratic governors but we all love our pickups and we all love our dogs and so we all love country music and I'm looking forward to your comments how we can advance it. Thank you. I am so delighted to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> A warm crowd anyway. I am so honored to be here at the NGA summer meeting in Santa Fe. I started my career actually covering um, politics for C-SPAN for nine years in Washington, D.C. before I made the move to Nashville to, to work in the country music business. So I've attended a number, numerous NGA conferences over the years. I covered four rounds of gubernatorial campaigns between 88 and 94. Um, so I know a little bit about all the work that you guys do in the states. I also will say that I'm much more comfortable having spent nine years at C-SPAN in the back of the room behind the camera rather than up here. Um, but I'm here today because I'm so passionate about music education and really appreciate the chance to talk to you about why we think a sequential music education in schools is so important to the future of our country. Um, many people wonder why CMA is here today and why are we involved in music education. So as, you, as the governor mentioned, the CMA was founded in 1958 in a hotel room in Miami. Elvis Presley was taking over the airwaves and country music radio stations were changing from, rock, from country music to rock and roll. And the executives at the time said, if we're gonna keep our jobs, we need to put our competitive interests aside and get together and work for the good of the business. And so they did that in 1958, and today we still work strongly as an industry. We're the longest running sequential trade organization representing one type of music. Um, today we work together, produce the CMA Awards. One of our priorities is how do we grow country music internationally? 
And we also hold the biggest, uh, one of the biggest fundraising events, the four-day CMA Music Festival, which we use to support our music education efforts. Now in its 47th year, CMA Fest, and some of you actually may know it as Fanfare. I don't know if anybody here has ever been there. But today we bring 80,000 fans per day to downtown Nashville, fans from all 50 states and 26 countries. And through that event, we raise two to three million dollar minimum each year to support our music education efforts. Thanks to the 350 artists that show up, all of whom donate their time and play for free. In fact, the CMA Foundation works each year to make intentional investments in music education throughout the country. In 2006, thanks to Kix Brooks with, uh, from Brooks and Dunn, the Country Music Association made the decision to start funding music education in public schools on behalf of those artists who play at Music Fest. Our first and our largest investment to date was made in, in uh, Metro Nashville, Music City, which didn't have a strong music program at all at the time. We began our partnership with Metro Nashville Public Schools in 2006 by investing a million dollars in revitalizing their music program and giving students access to new instruments. Since then, our $12 million investment has gone much deeper than just instruments. And along the way, we learned a lot about research, assessment, and accountabilities. What works and what doesn't work in a public-private partnership. And we're continuing to learn today. We developed an instrument repair shop. We provided side-by-side -side teacher coaching. We provided uh, private music lessons for students and professional development for music educators. This model has since expanded to over 60 programs throughout the US, dozens of school districts, and in collaboration with leaders like you, we've impacted the lives of more than a million students over the last decade. Our, you know, I get asked this a lot, you know, why do you guys do this? And our, our initiatives are not about the next generation of Dolly Partons, Carrie Underwoods, or Keith Urbans, but that would be great. But it's really about helping turn around poor performing schools and long-term workforce development. We believe in equity, access, and sequ sequential programs, whether it's a mariachi program in Washington State, keyboard programs in inner city Philadelphia, or recording, pro recording studios in boys and girls clubs and community centers in Detroit, Los Angeles, or Chicago. We know that music education helps students learn, achieve, and succeed. It bolsters student engagement and achievement in academic sub subjects. Recent studies show that ch children who participate in music education are 52% more likely to graduate on time than their non-music peers, 7% more likely to come to school in the morning, as well as have higher grade point averages. And they also test 16% higher on ACT English scores and 9% higher on ACT math. We, need, we know that music education builds self-esteem, self-discipline, encourages collaboration, and builds character. Now let's listen to some doctors and see how music has impacted their lives. My name is Roy Pinson. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive Officer at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. I'm Frank Fish. I am a Professor of Pediatric Cardiology at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. Well, the musician me is Susie Brown, and the doctor me is Dr. Brown Sachs. I'm a cardiologist, and I specialize in taking care of patients with advanced heart failure. And in the other time, I'm a singer-songwriter and a mom. These days I mostly play electric bass and some upright bass. I play in a couple of bands that play some sort of modern jazz. Music for me today is playing in a R&B band named Soul Incision. I think the thing that music has given me is an outlet to just be completely myself. Well, everybody loves music at least some kind of music. There are a lot of physicians that are good musicians. And I think it's because being a physician and being a musician tap into different parts of the right brain, left brain thing. I think you have a set of basic tenets that you begin with, but you apply them in a unique fashion to every patient the same as you would every new piece of music. And people often ask me, some patients that know that I play music, they say, well, what kind of music are you gonna to listen to during my case? And I say, none. I listen to your heart. I listen to what the heart's doing 
I don't I don't listen to other people's music. I'm listening to you. Knowing discipline and knowing how to practice will help you do everything in your life. And I think actually that's why being a doctor and being a musician are sort of related. If you practice, you can learn to do just about anything. I mean, things that you thought were impossible if you just set your mind to it and work at it, you can accomplish. Uh, I would like to thank my music teacher for caring about me, the time and energy they put into it, and in particular, I really appreciate the patience that they showed. If I could thank my music teachers now, it would be thanks very much for making me do it, because there were times that I didn't want to do the practice, and learning technique, and doing all the things that are necessary to make the music sound good to other people, not just good to yourself, was very important. If a parent were to tell me that they thought music classes should be replaced by math or science or something more useful. I would say that in my own experience as someone who chose a career in the sciences that I totally disagree and that for me I wish there had been more music in my education. I think music education presently is, is, is vastly undervalued. To me, more than any of the other arts, music is something that just permeates us in a way that uh, is the essence of our humanity. And I think to deprive kids the opportunity to be part of that is a crime. Maybe they're gonna, never going to be a professional musician, or maybe they're going to be a virtuoso. But if they're not handed that opportunity at an early age and find out that it's fun or find out that they're exceptionally talented, that's never going to happen for them, and it has to happen in the schools. And as a community, as humanity, we owe it to our kids to be able to provide that opportunity at an early age and support and nurture that all the way through. I, I can't imagine not supporting music education. As business people, we recognize that it's not just about helping teachers and students today, but just like you as governors, we think it's about ensuring a stronger and competitive workforce for tomorrow. Thanks to the state ESSA plans, you and your state education teams are central to the success and implementation of education programming. This includes music as part of a well-rounded education. In fact, we just worked with our governor in Tennessee, Governor Haslam, and the Tennessee Department of Education to provide a new arts administrator for our state, and we committed a million dollars for grants to assist eight districts throughout our state. This initiative seeks to leverage Tennessee's rich history in the arts to launch a statewide program focused on expanding students' access to high-quality music, music and arts education. We're proud to be working with many of you on innovative uh, initiatives in your states already. And while we don't have endless funds, our executive director, Tiffany Kearns, has endless energy. So I want to introduce Tiffany for a second over here. Um, and I hope some of your state staffers may spend a moment to say hello to us today. Uh, she has endless energy, and she really is key at connecting key officials with nonprofit leaders and funders whenever we can. We believe the collective impact of government and the private sector working together means that our children can have an outlet for self-expression, our teachers have strong professional development to help them with the many challenges in the classroom today. And our communities have an educated and strong workforce for the next generation. One of the things we pride ourselves on, besides our great country music, uh, is the value add that our team creates as connectors and relationship builders in the music education space. If you'd like to learn more about the quality music education programs we support, or some of our learnings and working in a public-private partnership scenario, please reach out to Tiffany. And on behalf of our country music industry, our artists, and the millions of fans every day, we applaud you, the governors, in, in, your, in your important mission of making music education available to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Trainer, I also want to thank you for, I believe you have a photograph of uh, the Wenatchee uh, Marachi Band, which is a nationally recognized band. And I can tell you, when I see those kids playing music, and they did it in the nation's capital, that was the best music coming out of the nation's capital for some time. So thanks for featuring that band. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ayers, uh, I'm really looking at your comments. By the way, uh, you just read, uh, uh, wrote a book. It won the Lincoln Prize. It was called The Thin Light of Freedom. And I just wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that book and maybe weave it into your comments about the broader theme here. That's really dangerous. Uh, <laughs> I can actually talk about this book. I think everyone would want to buy an inner case of them that are uh, suitable for any gift-giving occasion. Uh, I tried to figure out something we've been wrestling with for a long time. How in the world 
did the United States go into a civil war that no one intended or wanted, but that ended up with the greatest accomplishment in our history, which was ending perpetual bondage for four million people. That's sort of more of a challenge. Yes, I'm going to... I won't repeat all that, but it's a, a freaking awesome book. Uh, it tries to explain how we got into the defining event of our history, the American Civil War, and how that defining event ended up doing something that one, no one had been able to predict beforehand, which was to bring emancipation for the four million people held in perpetual bondage in this country. So it takes us down on the ground. It looks at it through the eyes of common people in the North and the South, and black and white, and soldier and civilian. So thanks for the opportunity to make that comment. My comments that I want to make now harmonize with my predecessors. Um, I'm going to strike a somewhat different note and present uh, the National Governors Association with a challenge at the end. And I want to begin with a puzzle. Now everyone, regardless of party, agrees that our nation's history is the foundation of all that we are. Everyone appeals to history, salutes our history, is proud of our history, and wants our children to know our history. Americans seek out history in best-selling books and television shows, movies and musicals, in tourism and genealogy and explorations of the very DNA. But here's the puzzle. American history has been diminished in our schools over the last two decades. History is disappearing from the elementary curriculum in schools across the United States, folded into language arts classes, mined for texts, but ignored for its rich and human historic meaning. Children are not learning to think historically as part of their fundamental education, as a part of the way they see the world. The range of the history we teach in space and in time is narrowing. Now this is a profound loss to our students, our schools, our communities, our states, and our nation. History teaches fundamental facts taught nowhere else. And by facts, I don't mean the list of presidents and the facts that people I meet on airplanes always think that history teaches. Here are the facts that I mean. The world has not always been this way, and it will not stay the way it is now. People of all kinds move history in ways both terrifying and inspiring. True knowledge of history is based on evidence, not political convenience or wishful thinking or national vanity. There are no more important facts than these. No knowledge more important for all our students to share. So given this undeniable value of history, how did we lose it in the schools? How we, did we diminish something that everyone values? We did not do it on purpose. We lost history when we were looking in other directions. When we focused our energy and resources on subjects we considered more essential at the time. In part because it is all around us, we took history for granted, forgetting how hard it is to teach history well, how essentially history is to understand how the nation and the world got to where they are. But fortunately, if history teaches us one lesson, it is that change is constant. Despite the erosion of history's place over the last 20 years, we are surrounded by talent, ideas, goodwill, and momentum in the history education community. Devoted historians and teachers and curators have never stopped working during the years of neglect to keep history alive, to make it more vital and innovative. We are ready to teach history much better than we did in the past, when we too often relied on dull textbooks, rote memorization, uninspiring lists, vacuous vocabulary words, and putatively important events whose significance students didn't really understand in, even if they knew when they happened, more or less. The time has come to put the same energy and commitment into history education that we put into science and math and music education. We need to approach our understanding of our social lives with the same urgency that we have devoted to understanding the physical world. And in fact, good history education bears strong affinities to good science education. The key to both is discovery, experimentation, confronting evidence without the lesson already scripted 
beforehand. Now, there's been a revolution in history over the last 20 years that many people have missed. Thanks to the National Archives, the Library of Congress, the National Historic Preservation and Records Commission, the National Park Service, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and other forward-looking groups, our students can see the rich record of the people of America in ways that students could never see it before. Many of your state archives have been doing remarkable work in sharing the resources of your state and local courthouses and other records. Students can now see history firsthand, finding true stories in thousands of digitized newspapers from their own communities. They can trace complex patterns in maps across generations. They can see military records and oral histories and television footage from the 1950s. History is becoming discovery. And historians are working hard to create new ways to see the past. On the screen behind me are glimpses of some tools right now, free to any teacher anywhere in the country. The maps from a project called American Panorama are being used by teachers from the sixth, sixth grade to graduate school. I'm also involved in a podcast, Backstory, that registers millions of downloads across the country and around the world as it discusses, sometimes humorously and sometimes solemnly, ways that American history helps us to understand the American present. And we've recently started a new project called Bunk, named mockingly after Henry Ford's quote that history is more or less bunk, that captures and connects representations of the American past in all media every day, showing how vital and inventive our conversations about history are, even when we don't label them necessarily as history. And the exciting new tools such as these are being created at museums and universities and historic sites coast to coast. Just as science has been repeatedly revolutionized by new tools and methods of observa observation, now history is finding new ways to see the complicated patterns of the past and the individuals who made those patterns. For the first time, we have the equivalent of telescopes and microscopes to view the past at new scales, ways to see the entire nation and individuals within it with new clarity. We can reach millions of students at vanishingly low cost. Now, speaking of cost, let's talk about revenue in American history. Over half of the nation's 35,000 museums are devoted to history. And museums, among the most trusted institutions in our country, each year generate more than $50 billion for the nation's G GDP, helping to make history tourism one of the most important drivers of every state's economy. Unfortunately, our history museums are not seeing as many students as they should because students don't have funds or time, given the priorities established by high-stakes testing, for field trips. In those places, young minds could be touched with imagination and excitement. There are more students than we would like to admit who don't have a chance to visit the museums down the street from where they live. They deserve that opportunity from their states. An investment in sending students to historical museums and sites would pay both immediate and long-term benefits, strengthening your civic core and your educational system at the same time. Another investment would be good business and good leadership. Paying teachers what they deserve should be one of your highest priorities. We seem to have forgotten in the era of standards and testing that teachers are the key to teaching. We need to recruit excellent young people into the teaching ranks through encouragement and incentive. And once we're in the classroom, we need to free, enable, and encourage those teachers to connect with their students so students can connect with each other and with the world. Teachers of history, like all teachers, need to be recognized and rewarded, offered opportunities to advance their learning and to collaborate with one another. And beyond that, I hope you will look for ways to include your teachers and historians and curators on commissions and advisory bodies. I guarantee you that you are all confronting problems and opportunities handed to you by your past. And so you would do well to make historians your allies to help you frame your approach. Visit the classes taught by the inspiring teachers in all of your states at all levels of education. Talk with business and civic leaders about the importance of education that helps make people 
better people, not just better workers. Foster collaboration among teachers at every level. Now, fortunately, and this is the challenge, there is something the National Governors Association can do collectively right now to advance these larger purposes. You can resolve to help make our nation ready for the 250th anniversary of our country in 2026. You can encourage the impressive sponsors among you to support innovative and inclusive approaches to sharing the history of our nation with its own children, a history in which everyone can see themselves and a future for themselves. We should celebrate that anniversary from the ground up, from each of your communities and states, from every classroom and all of its students. Together, in a bipartisan spirit, you can help the nation use its anniversary to build true unity, a unity born of honesty and inclusion. We can regain what we unintentionally gave away, a vital engagement with our own past, rooted in schools and museums, tapping exciting possibilities that did not exist just a few years ago. There are historians in every state organizing effective groups already thinking about this anniversary and eager to work with you. In sum, our history is our very definition of who we are and who we believe we can become. We teach history to our children and to ourselves every day, but by omission as well as by intention. We can either teach that history based on respect for evidence and expertise, or we can make up a history that supports what we think at the moment. I vote for schools and museums as the places to which we entrust our history. I vote for innovation and openness. I vote for teachers. And I vote for a renewed dedication to our past is the only true way to our future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Ayer. I obviously think like you. I appreciate your comments about teachers needing a decent wage. And therefore, I'm going to read your book. So thank you very much. I look forward to that. With that, I would love to throw the uh, table open for questions from my fellow governors to the panel. Uh, anyone who has a question would like to, uh, Governor Sandoval. Governor Inslee, thank you, and I love your art. Uh, I think that's a beautiful piece of art, and I want to congratulate that, and hopefully I'll have an opportunity to bid on it. It looks, it's beautiful. You can say that because you're not running again, so you won't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it. I like that. Yeah. So this is half question, ha half comment, and thank you to the panelists, and you know, frankly, I'll admit that I was somebody who didn't have as full of appreciation of the arts as I should have. And I, the arts community really came to me in Nevada and uh, really opened my eyes to what you've all talked about, and including history education, et cetera. But there's an issue that I want to ask you about, and it's an intersection which is part of my initiative, which is governors staying ahead of the curve and the innovation governors and the advent of autonomous vehicles and artificial intelligence and uh, technology. And I had the opportunity, a good friend of mine gave a commencement speech at the University of Nevada, and it was a speech to the College of Liberal Arts. And what she talked about was putting the human in humanity and talking about how more and more uh, people, and particularly young people, are relying upon algorithms and artificial intelligence um, to make decisions. And we are losing um, creativity because of this reliance on technology. And so, you know, I'm a big believer in STEAM and adding the arts to, to STEM. But for employers who are now looking, you know, we have our next panel is going to be on the skills gap. and. Uh, you know, how we have to upskill individuals, but lost sometimes in that conversation are those liberal arts majors and in the arts and musicians and historians and all of that. So could you comment on what you've talked about and how the arts sh should fit in this new economy, this fourth industrial revolution? I'll, I'll start, I guess. One of the things that I, I'm a liberal arts undergrad, I went to business school, 
later, but I, I firmly believe in everything you just said in terms of, of being able to, um, I'm a big supporter in, in students studying liberal arts and learning to think, and then you learn the technology and all those things. But one of the challenges that we find is we're working in the classroom with teachers um, and hearing some of the challenges they have with scheduling and issues with superintendents or even parents, is in some cases parents are having to choose between an arts class and a computer class. And when you're worried about whether your child's going to be able to, to go on to higher education or even just get a job straight out of high school, often they'll make that decision, I'm going to go to shop or I'm going to go to computer class because those skills are more transferable than an arts class or an American history class or things. And I think, think um, really from the top down as, as uh, business leaders, we need to say it's important to learn how to think, it's important to learn how to write so that we can then understand the ethical uses of AI and the other businesses that are going to be driving our economy going forward. Um, I, but I think it really has to start at the top. We're getting ready to launch in a few weeks a campaign across the country called It Starts With Me. And me is music education, but it really applies to all the topics you guys are talking about with people holding up pictures of themselves studying music when they were a child. And one of the things we're looking to do is not just feature artists, but feature politicians and business leaders and people who got to study um, courses that made them well-rounded before they went out into the work. So I, I appreciate that. You're, you're right on. I was saying some of the uh, digital history projects that I was talking about, we had students from 18 different majors at the University of Richmond helping us make things. Uh, and then one of the projects we made, National Geographic ranked as one of the 15 best maps made in the world that year with undergraduates. So the boundaries among all these things in the lives of our students are not near, nearly as distinct as they seem when you look at the, the list of courses. They're eager to cross these things. One of my star undergraduates is in Nashville now, uh, in one of the most embarrassing moments of my life, uh, made me sing a verse of The Weight by the band with his band. Uh, I'm, I should not have mentioned that. I, that might exist somewhere on video. But the, the thing is our students are showing us the way. They want to combine these things and they don't want to segment themselves and define who they are when they're 18 years old that they can't grow going forward. I do want to comment as well. I think that um, it is a very significant challenge, um, obviously, and um, integrating the arts into other subjects, I think, can, can be very effective, um, especially looking at innovative fields and, and you know, teaching at a very young age the critical thinking skills that comes through arts education. Um, I think that, you know, we have a lot of models throughout the United States where the arts are integrated into other curriculum and has been very effective at seeing, um, you know, an increase in academic achievement, especially in the areas of reading and science and, um, and math. So, uh, you know, as leaders um, in your own respective states, looking at our arts curriculum and, you know, looking at ways to integrate it whenever possible um, into other activities at, at the youngest ages, I think is really critical. And, um, you know, exposure to the arts on a regular basis can really help, um, you know, with that human element that you're talking about and, and making sure that children um, have an appreciation and can learn from the rich arts and culture of our various states. Well, uh, thank you. We want to thank our panelists. Just a closing comment. I know uh, uh, my fellow governors will share our observation that this session has reinvigorated our commitment to make sure that we go back and when we think of our educational budgets, we don't think just about math and science curriculum. And we know we've made a mistake in this regard, squeezing down budgets for arts and music and extracurricular work and drama. Uh, and when we've done that, we've lost out op educational opportunity for our kids. So I want to thank this panel, reemphasizing how important this is to our economy and to our children. Let's give them a round of applause. Thanks a lot to this great panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.